let's um, quickly recap about why we need circuit breakers. And I'm gonna go to the questions. We need circuit breakers because of a couple of reasons, right? We want to fail fast. This is something that you will uh, hear in a lot of uh, microservice conferences, microservice uh, theory. Failing fast is a good thing. Doesn't mean you're trying to fail. It's just that if something were to actually fail eventually, it's better to fail fast than to take your time and fail later, right? That's what failing fast means. So failing fast is a good thing. And with circuit breakers, you're actually doing that. When you realize that something is taking time and it's being slow and all that stuff, you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna fail fast from now on. I'm not gonna call that service and have it time out and eventually return an error. I'm just gonna do it right away, right? That adds to the uh, resilience and the fault tolerance of the microservice. Failing fast is a good thing. Next, having fallback functionality. Circuit breakers provide you with that fallback functionality. And then the third thing is the automatic recovery portion. Again, this is due to the sleep timeout, right? So you're gonna time out for a bit, not send a bunch of requests to a already failing service. And then when the timeout is expired, you're gonna say, okay, now I'm gonna try again. I'm gonna ping him, see if he's responding. If he's responding again, it continues. If not, it's uh, you can extend the timeout or you can um, do other things. This is a circuit breaker pattern. When do you break the circuit? What to do when the circuit breaks? And when to resume the request? These are the things that you will have to do if you were to implement the circuit breaker yourself. Do you want to implement the circuit breaker yourself? I don't know about you, but I don't want to do it because implementing a circuit breaker is going to require doing thread programming, concurrency programming in Java, which I am not a fan of. I don't think I'm good at programming concurrency. I don't think most programmers are good at programming concurrency. I don't think uh, people like doing that. I don't think people like doing network programming and timeouts and concurrency and all that stuff. Thankfully, you don't have to do any of this. Let's do a framework called Hystrix. So we're gonna break for questions and um, you guys let me know if you wanna do uh, like a, a five minute break before we get into the implementation. Now we're gonna get into the fun stuff. You've covered all the theory, right? We have covered the theory about what uh, circuit breakers is, why it's needed, what are the parameters that are required, and now we're going to be looking at the Hystrix framework and how you can actually implement it in a Spring Boot application, in the Spring Boot application that we've seen, and actually put all that theory into action. All right, so we're going to be doing that, but I'm going to break for questions. Okay, how do you know the thread pool size available on a PC? Uh, it's not something that's available on a computer, it's what's configured in your sublet container or web server. So the way to know what's being configured is to look at the configuration. And again, that depends on the sublet config container itself. So in the case of Tomcat, it's probably sitting in an XML file somewhere or something like that. So you would look at the configuration to see how much threads you have allowed. Uh, you do that, you do have that limit because you don't wanna allow unlimited threads because if you have allow unlimited threads, then it's eventually gonna run out of space and the process is gonna go down. So most production deployments have a limit and they're gonna say, if it goes beyond it, don't allow because you want the server to continue running. You don't want that to go down, right? So you look at the configuration to figure out how many threads are allowed. Is there any theory of how to determine those patterns? Those, pa sorry, those parameters. Is there any theory of how to determine those parameters? I'm assuming you're talking about the circuit breaker parameters. I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, literature written around how you get to it. But in my experience, it's basically trial and error. You try something, it works, it doesn't work. If seven, when it doesn't work, you realize what was it that you should have done to have made it work. And then you tweak the parameters. And over time, you get a sense for what's the traffic your application is getting and what are the parameters that works. But then that's real world wisdom. I'm sure you can read uh, textbooks and academic papers which give you hints about what things you can apply to get to that number faster, right? Rather than do a lot of trial and error, uh, it's basically knowledge that you can apply to minimize the trial and as a result, minimize the error and get to the ideal number quicker for your scenario. Via performance test and estimated of expected load. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one way of doing it. Performance test can give you a hint before actual real users face it. So that's, the, yeah, that's a good point. You can do performance tests.
to evaluate that. If we implement default response value, how does a client handle it? Does the client show it as a default value or does it interpret it as an error message? It's uh, recommended to have the client not be aware of it at all, okay? What's the problem with error message? I told you like it's bad for a microservice to throw an error message. Why is it bad? It's bad because when something throws an error message, something else needs to handle it, right? When, anytime there is a throw, there has to be a catch. So let's say there is a microservice downstream which throws an error. The thing that's calling that microservice needs to catch it. Or if it doesn't catch it, that's gonna fail, throw an error message, and the thing that's calling that needs to catch it. So imagine a system where you have like gazillion microservices calling a gazillion other microservices, any of them can fail, which means each microservice needs to handle a gazillion errors, right? That's not a good place to be in. So what I would recommend is not have error messages as much as possible. The fallback mechanism provides you a way to return something so that the consumer application is not even aware that it's a fallback it ideally shouldn't be aware that it's a fallback. So in that sense, there's no catching that needs to happen. It's just going through the happy path scenario, right? I think that's the way to go. You can have the, uh, the downstream microservice be aware of the fallback. You can probably have like some code uh, or some ID or something like that that says, okay, there's a fallback message and it can possibly do different things. But then that's something that I would try to avoid because again, the minute you get to the business of catching and handling errors, it's just a lot of work and you don't want to do that. What if the latest response is expected to be modified and we send cached response for the same request? That is true. You're not going to get the latest response, but then the alternative is to not get a response at all, right? If the threads are accumulating, you're not going to get a response at all. So you might as well break the circuit, return an, uh, an old response so that it's something and then once it recovers, return the updated response. You don't wanna be doing this with uh, mission critical applications, right? Somebody's checking their bank account, they withdrew some money and they still see all the money in their bank account, that's, that's not right. So maybe it's still valid and say, okay, it takes time for it to catch up or whatever, but there are certain cases where you, you're guaranteeing accuracy, in which case caching is obviously not gonna work, but uh, let's say a Facebook feed or something like that, in which case caching is definitely better than saying your feed is not available. So yeah.